So as soon as I get the nod from Mike that we're, we're broadcasting, we are indeed good to go. Right, so hello and welcome to everybody who is following along on YouTube. We are also broadcasting via Adobe Connect and we have a chat room full of people. So um, if I'm talking, that's who I'm talking to. But please feel free to leave a note wherever you may be. And uh, if I don't see it straight away, I'm sure I will see it later. We always leave the chat open. So if you're with us in Connect, that chat window will remain open all evening. You can type your questions in there, your queries. If you want to send a private message, there is a Q&A pod on the left hand side and you can get messages to me and Mike directly from there. But other than that, we are good to go. And indeed, that looks pretty good, too. So all I need to do now is to uh, get my slides ready and uh, get going. So what I need to do here is make sure that the people who are with us on YouTube can see my desktop. I'm not liking the look of that. I'm not liking the look of that at all. What I'm seeing is mm, too much of my desktop. So uh, let's get this sorted out first. Bear with me a second. I'm waiting for it to catch up. Probably about a minute. I, I'm not liking what I'm seeing. All I'm seeing is, um, I tell you what I'm going to do is share some of my, uh, my slides. And uh, that will prove to me whether it's uh, displaying correctly or not. Um, it should be displaying correctly in Connect. That's looking good in Connect. Not looking so good in YouTube. So. What I'm going to have to do is do something different in YouTube, so bear with me. My desktop is coming through, but not all of it, <laughs> which is never good. So if you're with us on YouTube, bear with me for a second while I attempt to do something different with that. Let me do a new share and hopefully that will come through better. So I want to share a monitor. I want to share my iMac. That looks better. Save that and hopefully that will work better. So. I'm going to add another one of those and I'm going to share that one and hopefully that will work much better. So on YouTube, you should be catching up with me any second now. I am going to assume that that's working because I'm brave like that or foolhardy, depending on, on how you look at it. No, but it will be in a second. Right. It will be. She said, hopefully you're, you're behind. When you catch up, it'll all be all right. Trust me. <sighs> Ah, oh, the confidence, or is this foolhardiness? Great, I'm hearing it looks good in Connect. Fantastic. As long as it looks okay on YouTube, then we're good to go. We don't want to be any longer. We've got to get on with this. So hopefully you can now all see my slides and I am indeed good to go. Well, hello and welcome officially. I am here to bring some clarity to the mystery of blend modes tonight. With our event, Will It Blend? Now, it says Photoshop blend modes, but it's just as applicable to many other applications as I will shortly discuss with you. So for those who don't know me, I'm Elaine Giles. I've been a trainer for more years than I care to admit publicly, really. And I currently present the Map Bytes podcast. I am also the user group manager of the Northwest Adobe user group in the UK, which is an official Adobe user group. And I know that a lot of you who are with us tonight picked up the event via the Adobe UK uh, Twitter account. So very welcome to you. But that's it. Let's get back to blend modes. Enough of me. Let's look at blend modes. Now, let me ask you, put in the chat or give me a comment. Are you using blend modes? Is it something that you struggle with and what apps? Now, the ones in Connect have already talked about that a lot. And uh, it seems that Photoshop's doing quite nicely, but also Pixelmator. So Pixelmator is incredibly popular. So what apps have you got and do you use the blend modes? And while you're doing that, I'll start explaining blend modes. Don't be put off. Blend modes, there's a lot of them. What I've done here is um, categorize them. So I will show you how to get to them, how to use them. But at a theory level, there are six groups of blend modes. And if you've looked in your interface, some of these rather odd titles will be instantly familiar to you. So there is a normal section and within there you have normal and dissolve and then you can categorize and actually in your interface these are categorized. They are separated with little separator bars. There is a set of blend modes that darken, a set that lighten, a set that work with contrast, a set that inverts and a component set at the bottom. So there are lots and lots of blend modes. They're also pervasive in most image editing, ed image editing applications and they can be confusing. They're strangely named, but all will become clear, I promise. So what applications? Well, any version of Photoshop going right back to the beginning, you will find some degree of blend modes. 
So uh, Photoshop, not a problem at all. They have added more blend modes over the years, but the core blend modes go way, way back. And the newer ones tend to be the more esoteric ones that you wouldn't be using that often anyway. But in Photoshop, and this is Photoshop CC, that is where you will find blend modes when you're talking about layers. So layer blend modes, that is where you will find them from the layers panel. And there are the categories that I've discussed. So you have the top two and then you have the next five which are darken and the next five which are lighten. And many, many of these applications look, if not identical to that, incredibly similar to it. So Photoshop CC, Photoshop CS6, CS55, way back. So I'm sure Gary will confirm CS3 has got layer uh, blend mode, so no problems there at all. But you will also find them in Adobe Photoshop Elements. Now, the current version is version 12 and it's not been out that long. It is the most cost effective alternative to Photoshop if you want to have a version of Photoshop on your desktop. It's also from Adobe your only option if you do prefer a boxed product rather than a subscription service. The, th the important thing here that I must get across is that it is available in the Mac App Store and you may be tempted to go to the Mac App Store for it because you would then be able to install it without the horrors of activation. But be very careful. The Mac App version does not include the organizer element of Elements 12. Elements 12 itself is two applications. There's the editor and the organizer. It's a little bit like Bridge. But in the Mac App Store version, they are not allowed to ship two distinct applications in one product. So the organizer is just missing. You can't actually get it via the Mac App Store. And worse than that, much worse than that, is that it's an old version in the Mac App Store. There is only version 11 available. Another problem getting it via the Mac App Store is that when it is updated, there are no upgrade prices. So you have to completely buy a new version. If you choose not to, that's fine. You can keep using the old one, but you will not be able to download it anymore because they take it out of the store. So be very careful when it comes to Photoshop Elements. It's a good application, but just be careful how you buy it. And then there's Pixelmator. And I know a lot of you are using Pixelmator. And as I've said, the good news is you're not left out of the blend modes party, not at all. Now, it's a Mac only application and it's only available via the Mac App Store, but it is only £20.99 and sometimes you can even get that half price. It's a very powerful application. It can read Photoshop files. It's fantastic for if you have Photoshop at work, but you don't have it at home. You can round trip your files. You can open them in Pixelmator, work on them, save them back to Photoshop and take them back to work. So that it's great for that. So uh, I shall put some links into the chat for that. Given the price, can I actually recommend having that as well as Photoshop? Uh, there are things it does and it does it better and quicker than Photoshop. So definitely worth looking at. As you can see, this is Pixelmator. And although the interface is much, much darker, um, it's very similar when it comes to the blend modes. Very, very similar. So um, all of that is if you can do this in Pixelmator, you can transfer your skills to Photoshop and vice versa. No problem with those at all in Pixelmator. You also have another alternative if you're on a Mac, which is a great application called Acorn, which I've talked about before, and it really is a very powerful application. It's from a company called Flying Meat Software, great name. And this one is available via their website as well as the Mac App Store. So it's sort of a hybrid for you if you're not keen on the Mac App Store, uh, or if you don't want to buy from somebody's website and you would like to be able to put it on as many machines as possible because you can go either way with this. The great thing with it is there's a trial version available so you can see just how powerful it is. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you know, anything but Photoshop is going to be a poor relation to Photoshop. But that's not really true here. Acorn was the first image editing application on the Mac to support the Retina canvas. It's also got instant alpha, layer styles. It's got multi-stop gradients, quick masks. There's all sorts in there. It too also edits, imports and exports Photoshop files and lots, lots more. So it is worth looking at. 
As you can see, again, in the layers panel, you have blending. And when you look at the menu, very, very similar. In fact, this application's got a few extra modes as well. So it's actually got a few more than Photoshop. And the ones that are there that use the same name work in exactly the same way. Now, I said blend modes were pervasive, and what I meant by that was it's not just on the layers that you will find blend modes, although that's primarily where I will look at them. But you also have blend modes, although that says mode and not blend mode. It is referring to blend modes, and that is actually on a tool. That is the brush tool. So they do exactly the same thing, just in a fractionally different way. So I will actually have a look at that. So we've looked at names and we know where they are and we know what applications we're looking at, but what actually are blend modes? Well, they're just equations, they're mathematical formula. Now, it's not as hideous as it sounds, honestly, honestly. All it means is that every pixel in your image has a colour value, a numeric value. And here's a quick uh, rundown of how blend modes work. You're going to need a minimum of two layers because a blend mode works as an interaction between two corresponding pixels on the two layers or more layers and that is what creates the difference. So put simply, you have a numeric value of a pixel in one layer. The numeric value of the corresponding pixel in another layer you do work magic with the two and it computes an outcome based on the blend mode you've selected. So it is nothing more than saying this pixel value is three, this pixel value is four, add them together, now it's seven. It's as simple as that. They take input values, do something with them and give you an output value. The precise output value uh, depends on the input value and the blend mode. Now, that's the theory. That's as difficult as it gets. Honest, honest. I'm going to recap it now, but in very practical terms. So the first thing I said was you need at least two layers. For blend modes to work, you're going to need two layers. Now, the technique that I'm going to be looking at mainly tonight is going to look at just the two layers. I'm not going to get complicated and be using five and six until the very end. But I'm going to refer to them as the base layer, which is the lower layer of the two, and the blend layer. And the blend layer is the layer that has the blend mode applied to it. So where it normally says normal, I'm going to be changing the blend mode of that layer and I'm going to change it through all of the options. Now, you can use more than two layers, but two is the minimum. And I'm now going to show you just how simple that maths can be for a couple of blend modes. Obviously, it can get way more complicated, but we're not interested in that. We don't need to worry about the complexity. We just want to know what that actually looks like. So I'm going to use really simple arbitrary numbers just to demonstrate a principle. This one is the divide blend mode. I know every one of you can do the maths there. The base layer, which has a value of 100, is divided by the blend layer, which has a value of 50. And guess what? That gives us a value of 2. It's that simple. As I say, there are more complicated blend modes, but obviously multiply, divide, very, very simple. So this one's divide. Next one is multiply. So I take the same two numbers, I multiply them together, and it gives me a value. Now, obviously, these numbers weigh out, but just as a principle... That is the principle of it. It is that simple. So the examples I've given are very simplistic, arbitrary maths. The principle, however, is sound. And it demonstrates that if you took a blend mode, in this case, overlay, and you applied it to the blend layer. So that's my blend layer. It's just solid blocks of colour on a layer in Photoshop or Pixelmator. And I apply the overlay blend mode to that layer and I have that above the base layer, which looks like that, then this is what happens. That is what I get. So it's an overlay blend mode applying to three blocks of solid colour on a layer sitting above a photograph. And as you can see there, that is the overlay blend mode. The black is much darker. The white is blown out. It's um, certainly a very, very high contrast look, sort of a nuclear winter look. And in the middle, the 50% grey is pretty much ignored. So you can see the effect of what that, what that does to, to an image. So let's have a look at that again. How about we add a bit of colour into the mix? So brace yourselves. Yes, I'm taking this layer, which is um, a rainbow gradient. That's my blend layer. And I'm going to take that 
and the same image again, my base layer, and I'm going to apply a blend mode to the rainbow layer and it's going to turn into that. And that again is the overlay blend mode. So what it's doing is it's doing a, the, the mathematical calculation for overlay and that is the finished result. Now, I'm going to mix it up a little bit now and I'm going to ask you, that's very subtle, that's a very subtle change, that is different. That is overlay, that is something else. And there is a difference between the two, but it's subtle. Anybody want to hazard a guess which blend mode that is? It's actually quite a useful one. This is something that you could use quite a lot uh, in retouching, um, recolouring images, changing hues. It's that kind of blend mode. Anybody taking a guess? We got any suggestions? Yeah. And what have we got? Underlay, soft light. Ah, soft light. No, it's not. This one is colour. This one is the colour blend mode. What it's doing is it's doing a comparison and then it's showing me a colour. So um, that one is very, very useful. Let's do Let's try another one. Can you show it again? Can I show it again? Which bit? Flora says, can you show it again? Which bit? I don't know. Oh, I can go right back to here. I took that, which is my blend layer. That's the top layer. And I took my image, which was that one, my base layer. I applied an overlay blend mode to the rainbow and I ended up with that. That is how I did that. And I will show you this in Photoshop. I'm going into Photoshop very soon. Then I showed you that one, which is a, a different one. That is the colour blend mode. But now I've got a really, really different one. So worth taking a guess. That one's very different. I'm sure somebody somewhere will find a use for that. Anybody want to hazard a guess what that is? It's very different and that's a clue. <laughs> Anybody guessed? Pin light. Oh, pin light. Pin light wouldn't look unlike that, but the, actually the clue was in it's very different. That is the difference blend mode. Difference. Difference, that one is. It's the difference between the two. I will show you a really practical use for that later. And then there's the last one, which is very, very nuclear winter. Very blown out. Anyone has a guess with that? Now, this one, there is a bit of a clue there. It's much, much lighter, which should tell you what about the colour values? Lighten. It's not lighten. Soft light. Not soft light. If I took a value and I divided it by something, it would be less than it was. And I've got less colour there. It's, it's the divide blend mode. Right, so that's the theory of it. But let's go and have a look at the practice. Um, I'm not going to concentrate on the intricacies of how blend modes work in terms of the maths. You're not interested. It's more important what you can do with them. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, what effects you can create, the photos you can improve, or maybe even salvage um, in some cases. So really useful for design work, for photographers doing composites and much, much more. So that's what I intend to, to look at. But for now, let's go in and actually have a look at it. So there we go. Somewhere in here, I have a Photoshop and I have an image. What I'm going to do to make sure that you are on the same page that I am is open up that image that I had in Keynote, which was this one. It was uh, my bench, my bench image. So let's take that as big as I can. Right in here. Let's look across over here. What I have is my my background. That is my base layer. Just to be absolutely certain there, I'm going to put in that that is my base layer. And then we're sure that is my base layer. And then I have three other layers and uh, I'm going to be looking at two of them. So that's what we're actually going to be looking at. The first one I showed you with this, was this one, which was, it. this says black, grey and white. This is my blend mode. At the moment, it's set to normal. And that's why it's a solid colour. That's why I can't see any of the bench at all. When you have layers in Photoshop and they are 100% opaque, and they have a normal blend mode, you do not see any of the pixels from the layers underneath unless they are transparent in this, this uh, layer, in what will be the blend layer. Now, obviously, I said opacity, 100%. The first thing you can do is change the opacity of that, and then you do start seeing the underlying pixels. And a lot of people, when they're trying to merge two images together and they're not really confident with blend modes, they do start resorting to the opacity and that's it. They don't do anything else with it. And then everything looks a little bit muddy. So there's a big difference between changing the opacity and changing the blend mode. But the two do work together. 
So if I change the blend mode on this, which I will do, I'll, I'll use overlay because you've already seen overlay. There's what the overlay blend mode looks like. But I can, if I go back to the opacity up here, change that and it will work in conjunction with the blend mode. So now I have overlay, but only at 50%. And you'll see if I dial it back, it's much less noticeable. And if I take it up to 100, you can really see the difference. So opacity has its place, but blend modes are actually far more useful. So that is if we had a normal, uh, an overlay blend mode on that layer. But there were some others, weren't there? There were others to have a look at. Uh, we talked about darken, darkening things. So I could choose darken and then explain what that's doing. Now, what darken does is it, it does a comparison of the pixels. Remember back to that, there are two layers, the base layer and the blend layer. Each one has a pixel in a corresponding location. And what the darken blend mode does is look at the two pixels and shows you the darkest ones. So it does a comparison between the two. And obviously here, black is always going to be a darker color, right? A higher value than anything else. So the brown of the trees, the white of the branches, the snow. So black wins out every time. In the middle where, where we've got the gray, it's going to be 50-50. Sometimes the blend mode will win out. Sometimes the base layer will win out. And over at the white end, not much difference at all. The complete reverse of that is to use the lighten blend mode. Now, what do you think will happen? Which bit will we see? What won't we see? Uh, what I'm going to do is move the chat so I can see it too. I see the chat there. There we go. Right. I'm going to change that to lighten. I want you to have a guess what's going to happen. Will we see the bench? Will we not see the bench? Right. Lighten. It completely flips it round. Now, the white pixels always win out because they have a lower value. So which is the lighter pixel of the two and white always wins out. Again, in the middle, it's quite muddy. It's gone, uh, not dark muddy, but it's, it's misty, very misty. And at the other end, um, all of those pixels are going to be lighter than the black. So we don't see any of the black at all. Now I'm going to go back to overlay and just show you the difference between that and another one that's really useful, which is soft light. Soft light is very similar to overlay, but more gentle, a little bit more gentle. So those two are really useful when it comes to working with your images. Now that's looking at the black and white. Let's have a look at the color. Let's go up and have a look at this one, which has solid yellow, solid red, solid blue, and a black and white for contrast at the bottom. And if I do exactly the same with these, then you will get an idea of how it works with color. So I'm going to go back to overlay. And now what it's doing is it's comparing and uh, you can see that I'm seeing both. So it's making a determination that I should be seeing some pixels from the base layer and some from the blend layer. And it gives me that effect. The black actually works quite nicely uh, on that bench. It's very dark, very punchy, very noir. You can see the white just takes it far too far. Very uh, high contrast. And um, that's actually the high contrast is used very frequently in portraits. Uh, but for this image, you lose quite a lot of it. So that's uh, my overlay there. Let's have a look at some of the others that we actually looked at. So soft light, the same but more gentle. So you should now be able to see that between overlay and soft light, if you're working with photographs, this is much more gentle. And if you just need to add in some color, but maybe not that much, don't forget you can dial your opacity back and get a very, very gentle effect with it. So overlay and soft light, incredibly useful, very, very useful. And then, of course, you've got those weird and wonderful ones that I talked about. So you have uh, luminosity doing strange things down there. Um, do you have saturation doing even more strange things? So um, like I said, the core ones are the ones that you will use most often. Now, another thing I need to show you is I'm going to go down to my base layer. I'm going to make a new blank layer. So I'm not being concerned about any of these um, layers that I've got there. It's a new layer. 
And uh, in fact, what I will do is I will duplicate the other one. That's what I'll do. I'll take the base layer and I will duplicate that and I'll do it straight onto there. So a copy of the base layer. Right. What I want to show you is that um, it's not just layers where you can use blend modes. You can be very precise with the blend mode by using the brush tool. So I've uh, got my brush tool. What I need to do now is to choose a color down here. So at the moment it's black. I'm going to choose something we can actually see. So a, a lightish blue. There we go. Now, normally, if I were to paint on top of a layer, it would be solid color. And you see, if I do that, it is. It's got a nice soft edge on the brush, but I'm painting over pixels and now those pixels are blue. And it isn't interacting with them in any meaningful kind of way. It's just painting straight over the top of them. Right. But up here, let me show you that mode. Remember that slide mode and they are blend modes and there they all are and they are identical. The ones that we've looked at. So if I were to choose overlay, which I have and there's my brush and I paint on the other side. Now I get an interaction between the color that's on my brush and the pixels that I'm painting over because the brush is actually painting pixels with in overlay mode with a blend mode attached in overlay. If I go back and I change that from overlay to soft light and carry on down here, you can see it's slightly more gentle. And there we go. So that is how you can use blend modes on a brush. Now, there is a problem with doing that, which is it's destructive. That's why I duplicated the layer first. Those pixels that are behind this aren't actually behind it. They've gone completely now. So if you are going to try this with a brush, do try doing it on a completely separate layer. Uh, you can play around with the history brush, but it's a bit uh, complicated. So just be very careful with that if you are painting directly onto it. Uh, have a get a firm understanding of the layers first and then move on to the brush. That would be a better way to go entirely. Right. But what does this mean practically? Uh, we've looked at all the theory there. What does it mean practically? So I'm going to uh, close that down. We don't need that and have a look at rescuing an image, rescuing an image with it. So I have an image here which is uh, overexposed. This is Mike. Luckily, it's overexposed um, in, in that area and nothing else. So what I've got here, it was a very dark day. Uh, it was a very sunny day and we were in shadow. So where we were, it's quite dark. So I'd use the flash. I actually have two of these images. Uh, that's the first one. And let's have a look at the second one. That is the second one. So one of them, the skin color was much better, but I can't see the eyes. And the other one very, very bleached out because I had to use the flash on it. But I can save this. Now, first thing to note, this is a raw image. And if I wanted to change the entire image, then I could do that in my raw processor. It could be Lightroom, could be Aperture, could be anything else. So my first step, have a, when I'm taking my raw image and I'm processing it, get it as good as I can then. But what I decided here with these was I preferred the smile on the one on the left, but I preferred the colors from the one on the right. And I don't want to just darken everything because if I do, I'm going to lose detail in the background. So for that reason, what I elected to do was to come in here and try and repair it slightly, improve the image with blend modes. So this was the finished product, which is subtle. I haven't changed any of the edges, but I have darkened down the face and the hand. So that's what I'm aiming for. And this is how I did it. So really simple. First of all, you need two layers at a minimum. So I need to duplicate that, which I can do with Command and J or Control and J on a PC. And there is my copy of it. And just so you know what I'm doing, I'm calling that my blend mode. This, of course, is my base mode. You know that now, don't you? There we go. And the first thing I need to do is to do something in terms of applying a blend mode to it. Now, which blend mode do you think I should use? What I want to do with it is bring back more detail in the face area. I'm not going to worry about what happens to the rest of the image because I'm going to apply a mask to that to mitigate the impact. But what blend mode would be a good blend mode to bring detail back into an image when it's overexposed? It has too many light pixels in it. So I need to do something with it to bring back some dark ones. And I'm getting darken or burn. 
Well, darken is a very good one to start with. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to choose darken. And mm, didn't darken it. Why not? Why not? Flora's right. I'll explain first why darken didn't work, because in theory it should. It's going to compare pixels and it's going to show you the darkest. Believe it or not, that's exactly what it's doing. Why? What's it doing? It's doing the right thing, but why hasn't it changed it? These two images are identical. So when it does the comparison between the two pixels, it says they're the same. So I'll just show you one or the other, it won't make a difference. The value is the same. So darken, while in theory you jump to it, no, it doesn't work. So yes, everybody's got the hang of this now. The image is the same, that's right. Now, Flora's spot on. Uh, I need to darken it, but the image is the same. And the way to do that is to take the two values and multiply them together. So if I change that to multiply, straight away it is much darker. It's far too dark around the edges, but the face, I can start to see a nice pinky glow come back to that. So I'm getting there with that. That's not bad at all. But I need to recover the lightness that I had around the edges of it. And the way to do that is quite simple. All I need to do is to put a mask on it. So I am going down here and applying a mask to it. And then I'm going to use my brush tool, which I do not want set to soft light. This is going to catch you out. Make sure when you're doing this that your brush mode is back to normal uh, and check your opacity and flow as well. I have those at 100% for this. And what I'm looking to do here, get a larger brush. How I'm doing that, I'm using the bracket keys. And what I'm going to do now is just paint on here around the edges like that. Now, what's happening is up here, as I'm painting with black, I'm just making sure you can see that. I am painting with black, but I'm painting with black on the mask, not the image. This is how masks work. So that's what I'm doing there. And that's what's bringing back the detail here. So I'm going to go up the edge. Now I've got some nice green detail back. I can bring back my sky detail and I can be as precise as I want to be with that. So bring back detail there like that. If I go too far, so let's, ha let's have an accident, shall we, like that. And I'm starting to put black paint in the wrong place. It's uh, now going white again. If I use the X key down here, so I'm pressing X, it sets my background and swaps it with my foreground colour. So it swaps the two. So I switch it to white and go back up here. And what that will have the effect of doing is reversing it. It will take away the black paint that I put on it. So I can with this go backwards and forwards until I'm much happier with it. So uh, get that like that. And that's a bit of an improvement. So let's have a look at the before. Very, very blown out. After, much better. But the hand is still a little too pink. Um, well, actually not pink enough. It's a little too white. It's a little too bleached. So what I want to do with that is carry on working with it, but I just want to focus on the hand. And the easiest way to do that is to duplicate the layer again. So I'm now duplicating the blend mode. So Command and J again, or Control and J, and now I've got two copies. So this one, blend mode copy, is blend mode number two. And now, oh dear, that's too dark in the face. But what I can do is take this up here, this layer mask, and I can carry on working on it by adding in more black pixels to cover the face, which lightens it up a bit. So I am lightening the bottom bit. And what I want to do is leave the hand so the hand is a little bit darker than it would be without that in it. And then all I've got to do is paint on there like that. So I'm painting around it. I can see that's about right. So look at the difference between my uh, masks here. This one is just the face. This one, it looks like just the hand. And a great way to see if I've got just the right area is to turn off the original. And then you can see what I've got. I haven't got all of Mike in here, actually, have I? So if I paint over here with some white, you should see me bringing the T-shirt back, bringing the ear back and a little bit more of the hair. So that's a really good way to get precise with it. Turn off the bottom layer and then turn it back on when you need it. Can also do that in regard to the hand. So you can see there, because my brush is so um, soft at the edges, virtually the hand is transparent and I don't want that. So what I'm going to do, first of all, make the, I'm going to paint on there, make the brush a bit smaller so it's just going to cover the hand. 
And if I make it smaller and I paint there with white, it should bring it back. So what I'm doing there, see that? It's coming back nicely. So it's a brilliant way of checking where you're up to with what you're bringing back, what you're masking and masking out and what you're bringing back. So something like that's probably about right. Turn that one on, turn that one on and I should have that complete now. So turn the two off, turn one on, that's the face repaired, turn the other one on and more detail comes back into the hand. So that is that one done. So that is an overexposed image repaired and um, no pixels were damaged. We can still go back to the original and uh, do different work with it if we need to. So it's non-destructively edited as well. Talking of non-destructive editing, let's have a look at another one. So I'm going to close that one down and have a look at a landscape, which is here. This is my landscape one. So let's open up that. There we go. Now, it's uh, it didn't look like that when it was taken, I'm sure. There's some beautiful colours there in those brick buildings down here but everything looks slightly muted there's some nice greens but the sky could look a lot better and down here too it looks a little bit muted now I could do that by applying a blend mode you are aware of that I could go in there and I could start I could make a duplicate of that and I could apply something to it in fact let's do that let's command and J and let's set this to what should we set it to Multiply, a little bit too strong, but we could dial it back with opacity. But it's applying to the entire image. Now, somebody mentioned before a burn. Now, dodge and burn is um, a technique many people are familiar with. Dodge and burn refers to um, an old technique in a, a, a wet dark room, which selectively changes pixels in an image and uh, you actually have dodge and burn tools to do it with over here. So uh, in your toolbox over here you have, if I open that and uh, let you see it, you have the dodge tool, the burn tool and the sponge tool. The problem with using these is that they are destructive. I can do it but as soon as I have I've changed the pixels in the image and that's it. Um, I'd have to undo to change them back. But there is a fantastic way that you can use dodge and burn with blend modes and get some fantastic effects where you can dodge and burn non-destructively. It's brilliant. So that's what I need to do. So the first thing I need to do is make another layer. So just to prove it's non-destructive, I'm going to delete that layer. So I've only got my original layer that I don't want to change. In fact, I can't change it because there is a little lock on it. So I can't make changes to that layer. What I do need to do is to create a new layer. Now, I'm going down here, but what I'm doing is instead of just doing that, if I click that, I get a new blank layer and there's no pixels in it at all. And I could dodge and burn away on there and nothing will happen at all. So I'm going to not do that. What I am going to do is come down to here and I'm going to uh, hold down a key and the key is the Alt or Option key. And what I get here is the new layer dialog box. And the reason that this is different is that it lets me um, set things up far better. So what I'm going to do is call this the blend, the blend layer. This is the one I'm going to blend. And I don't want the mode to be normal. I want it to be overlay. Now, before I do that, you'll see that in here there's a checkbox and I can't put a tick in it. There's nothing there. But when I set that to overlay, it becomes active and I can fill that layer with 50% grey. So a neutral colour of 50% grey by just putting a tick in a box and clicking OK. And although I've done that, there's no change to the image at all. But if we look up here, there are grey pixels on that layer. There really are grey pixels there. To see them, you change the blend mode back to normal. And there are the grey pixels. But as you know from that three block thing, the black block, the white block, the, the grey one in the middle, no effect at all. So if we turn that to overlay, that's great. Done. No problem. Now what we need to do, though, is to do something in here. So I'm going to get to the brush tool. I'm going to make sure that I have default colours. And uh, back down here again, they are blue and white at the moment. But if I hit the D key, D for default, it sets them to be the default and now I've got uh, a brush and I'll be brushing on this layer. This layer is already set to overlay and what I want to do is to bring back some detail in this area here where those houses are. 
So what I'm going to do there is just start painting. And I know it's greatly overdone, but I want you to be absolutely sure that this is doing something and it is doing something, isn't it? There we are. It is definitely doing something. Obviously, what I'd be doing with that is dialing back the opacity, the strength of it, etc. But there you go. I have definitely brought back detail there and I've brought back detail selectively. So I'm going to leave it set like that at the moment because I need to work on the rest of it. it. Would be really nice if I could get some detail back in that sky as well. So what I'm going to do over here, make sure I'm on the right blend mode. I'm going to make that brush much bigger and I'm going to try and do it in one pass. So I'm just going to swoop across from, from right to left and bring back some detail in that sky. I know it's overdone. Right, but as I said, I can bring that back. Now, it's made huge changes, but actually all I've been doing is painting with black and white. In fact, if I bring out, I will swap to white and I'll bring back over here, make that much lighter. It's not a good look, but there you go. I can paint with white and it brings back detail. So darkening it is the burning. Dodging is when it lightens it. And all I've done is paint with black and white, just to make sure you believe me. If I change that back to normal, that's what I've painted. In fact, you can see I've missed a bit. I've missed a bit, so I'll go back in and put it in while I'm there. I've also missed a bit there. So I'll paint that back in. I'll take that up a fraction. And if I turn that layer back to overlay, there is my dodging and burning. Obviously, it is way too much, but take the opacity down and uh, it's brought back detail. So you can dodge and burn non-destructively by using a blend mode. And that blend mode is overlay on a 50% grey background. So I really like that. Once um, I've been doing that for years and it was uh, one of those things. Once you found that, you'll never go back to doing it the other way, the old way. Trust me on that. So uh, that's another thing that blend modes can, can do for you. Right, let's come out of there. Got another one. Now, this one is, um, again, using blend modes in conjunction with something else. And I've opened that wrong image. I knew I shouldn't have opened that image. It's 1.3 gig. It's a very large scan. So what I'll do with it is when I've opened it, I'll immediately close it and get the smaller one of the two. But what I'm doing is I'm going to uh, demonstrate a feature where blend modes can help me sharpen an image. So uh, when this image finally opens, this 1.3 gig image, <laughs> I knew I clicked the wrong one. I used this one the last time I did it. I mean, it's the same image, but it's a much smaller copy of that image. There we go. Let's try the smaller one that's only a third of the size. Now, this is a scan. It was scanned from an old photograph and um, I've not touched it at all. This is as it was scanned. No changes at all were made to it. One of those good ladies is my mum and she looks a lot like me. That's this lady here, this little one there. So what I'm going to do, zoom in so you can see what I'm looking at here, which is it's a scan. It's quite soft. You should be able to see if I zoom in all the dirt and dust that was on that scan. So I've done nothing with it. Now, when I work with it, I'm going to want that. I'm going to want more detail bringing back into it. And that's something that I can do in here. So having zoomed in, I will show you the after. This is the before, just the scan as it was. And that's the after. I've probably overdone that a bit so you can see it. I wouldn't do it that much. But if I turn that on and off, you can see it is sharper. It's also glowing around the edges because um, it's overdone, but not to worry. Right, how do I do that? Well, what I've got in here is just one layer. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that layer, duplicate it. Now, in here, I am going to need a blend mode. That is going to be my blend layer. You know by now that the background's my base layer. I know you do. Right, what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to apply a filter to it and I'm going to go up here and in other I have high pass, a high pass filter. And you can see what that does. Let me get that out of the way for you. I've got preview turned on so you can see what it does. And as I slide this up and down, you can see it's bringing back a lot of the detail. And if I go down the other way, I can barely see it. Everything looks rather ghosted. Now, the thing is, with this, you don't really want to see a lot of the detail. You don't want this to be up here. You want to take it down as far as you can so you can just see the edges. So if I just show you there around the edges, you can just make out the edges there like that. 
Oh, and good grief, she does look like me. Terrifying. Might be able to take that down a little bit more, but I'll leave it set to, um, I'll set it to two so we can see some difference to it and hit OK. Now, obviously, that doesn't actually um, improve that in much, much of a way, but it will do if you link the high pass with a blend mode. So in here, if you change that to an overlay and then toggle it on and off, it does have the effect of sharpening it. And as Flora's saying, she goes high pass and hard light with low opacity. Just play around with it. You will get different um, effects with different blend modes. And it's fantastic to tweak away there. So absolutely try different blend modes. You'll find one works best for one image. You may have a favourite. Go with it. Absolutely go with it. What I'm going to do is show you one little extra thing with this, which is a nice touch for me. I like doing it this way. I'm going to throw away that blend, that, that uh, blend layer. I'm going to create another one. My problem is, if I've set it to two and then I want it to one, I've got to start again. But there's a way that you don't have to. So I'm going to start again. All right, this is my blend mode, my blend layer. All right, and this time I'm going to do something before I, ap I apply the high pass filter. I am going to go into here, making sure I'm in the right place when I click it, and I'm going to convert it to a smart object. And now it's a smart object. Right, why is she doing that? That's so I can change it sh shortly. So I'm going to go in and apply the filter to it. So back down to other and high pass. And instead of setting it to two, I'm going to set it to something really silly, like seven or eight. And again, you can see the preview. That's what I'm starting with. That's what I'm doing to it. And OK on there. Then I will change that to either overlay, soft light, whatever I want to do with it. You can see there's a huge difference, but it's glowing. It's far too much. But the benefit now is because it's a smart layer, it has a, you know, I converted it to a smart object. It has a smart filter on it, and that means that I can go back in and recalibrate that filter without having to start again. So I can do that. I've gone into the wrong bit there. Should be uh, in here to do that for me. Come on, high pass. Where you go. Take it down so it's around the one, one and a half, which is much more normal. And I can go back in and edit it. So a non-destructive way of doing that, which is quite nice. Otherwise, you are playing around creating duplicates with different settings and then deleting the ones you don't want. So that is another good use for it. So I shall uh, lose that image. But a really good way to learn about how, how to do this is to literally just have a play around with it. And this is what I'm going to show you with this one. Right, I have here two layers. You are used to the layers by now. I have here blend layer, I have base layer. Let's have a look at what's on them by toggling the, the view off. The base layer is just a standard image. Let's get that as big as possible. And um, it's of a building looking upwards. The next layer is another standard image. This is just black and white and it's a skyline. And literally by just changing the blend mode, you can create completely different effects here. So what I would do with that, just two changes that you could quickly do. Imagine that you want a poster for an event in London. Literally go down here, choose one blend mode, then choose another and get a completely different effect with it. So if I choose dark and what's going to happen, what will I see? Who's brave enough to go in there? Who's going to go in there and tell me what I'll see if I choose darken? Is it a trick question? Do I mean multiply? No, I don't. I really do mean darken this time. Which will be left, the light pixels or the dark one? Now, you should have got the hang of it by now. If it's the dark ones, I'm going to be left with the dark pixels. So what it does is it literally just takes all of the white pixels and I can't see them. Can't see them at all. Now, if I flip that and I go for lighten instead, I get none of the black pixels and all of the white pixels. To prove the point, if I were to move that, you can see that's all it's done. It's left me with the white pixels. That is literally it. That's all it's done. But it gives me a completely different effect when it comes to, in this case, doing a poster or anything else that I want to do with it. All of the other blend modes will behave slightly differently. You're interacting multiple different uh, options. So that one's uh, uh, quite nuclear again, isn't it? 
and uh, let's have a look at something really bizarre uh, you've got a subtract which gives you black at the top so if you did want to put the text on a black area you could do that and i'm doing nothing with this the alternative apart from changing a blend mode the alternative of course would be to painstakingly select the pixels and try and make a mask from them but if the pixels are black or white then blend modes are your friend you can instantly um, knock out the pixels that you don't want just by changing the blend mode and it's much quicker and then to finish it off just put some text on it so I've got there let me take this one back to let's have a lighten on there you can see I've got meters in London in 2014 there in the text so I can move that around and uh, I've got a poster very very easy very quick and literally not changing a pixel completely non-destructive as well now I'm going to use this one to show you something else so i am going to save that one i'm saving that file and what i'm going to show you with this one is i said whether you had pixelmator or whether you had acorn it really didn't matter and that acorn could open and pixelmator could open um, photoshop images so it's opened it on the other screen helpfully not so what i'm going to do is i'm bringing my interface back to my primary screen got to love this haven't you there's my interface and uh, there's my image my glass building so I'm going to open that and there it is um, this is my layers panel uh, so these my uh, here's my layers over here let's get rid of my layer filters here's my layers I have exactly the same layers and uh, this blend layer here was set to lighten there it is I can come in here set it to darken can set it to anything else and it works exactly the same as Photoshop it doesn't matter there is one difference and that is the text um, what Acorn does is it rasterizes the text that does not mean that you can't apply a blend mode to it so I could do a color burn on that and uh, drag it around and you will see it interacting let's try something else that's uh, more obvious no we don't want it lighter do we let's do something that you can see that you can see a color Come on, there we go. Something very different. Doesn't mean you can't do that with it. See me moving it around? But it does mean that you can't edit it very easily. That's the problem with it. But apart from that, wouldn't matter if this was Pixelmator, Acorn, or Paint Shop Pro on a PC. As long as it supports the layer blend modes, it should open it and be absolutely fine. So let's come out of Acorn. Don't need to save that. Right. If you've got any questions, do keep typing them in. Now, this is one of my favourites. Love this one. This is a really practical use for blend modes. Blend modes that you might think, I'll never use that one. So I'm opening up a file here, which was another scan. Now, this was a scan of, as you can see, Scooby-Doo with Shaggy. What on earth is she doing with this one, you're thinking? Well, it was a scan of something that wouldn't go through my scanner. So I had to uh, scan it in two halves. And what I need to do is to match the two together. Uh, fairly simple I guess over here I have a background which is just set to white on top of that I have the two pieces of the scan I have the bottom half uh, and I have the top half over on the left and what I need to do is drag this across and try and match it up but it's going to have to be pixel perfect and um, I might think it's okay but probably not quite that isn't quite right but how can I tell and um, it's difficult it's difficult but uh, if you change the blend mode of the top layer to difference so I'm going to go in here and choose difference you'll see where those images are different it's showing you they're different and what I want is if I move this on one side I deliberately when I scanned it scanned an overlap you can see the dog's collar and the t-shirt here so I need to get those lined up properly. You can see they're nearly lined up, not quite lined up, slightly off. They're still slightly off. I'm going to put it there. It's not bad. If I change that back to normal, it doesn't look too bad. You can see it's a pixel off, but it's not too bad. But if you go into difference and you start using your arrow keys to just move this one pixel at a time, you should find, you see it getting less and less, when it's spot on, there will be no difference between the two layers. And when there's no difference, there will be an overlap area that should be black, solid black. So if I keep going, that's a little bit nearer. Nope, that's further away. Need to go one way or the other. 
keep going a bit. Oh, come on. Should be totally black. Let me try doing it this way. It might be a bit quicker. Oh, on the other hand, it might not. <sighs> come on. One of those that worked in rehearsals brilliantly, I'll tell you. Nope, that's going the other way. Nearly there. Oh, that's, that's me moving it down now. Need to move it across slightly, don't I? I'm going to move that across for me. Come on. There we go. Almost. Almost. Oh, it's letting me down. It definitely will go black if I get it into just the right spot. But where is just the right spot? Nearly. Nearly. Almost there. But trust me, it would go black. Honestly. And then I would turn that back to normal and it's spot on. So that is a practical use for difference. I wouldn't suggest that you leave it there um, all the time, like using difference, but it's great for something like that. Another place I've seen difference is when you're comparing two photos. Um, I've actually seen it used when police are comparing documents. These documents are supposed to be the same and they're slightly different. So they've used it and instantly you can see the difference between the two. So a really practical use for a blend mode that you may well ignore. You might choose to ignore that one thinking, well, it's, it's not much use visually, but it can be very useful. So let's get rid of that one and let's have a look at a calendar. Right, what I've got here is an image which is an image I've used before, but I used it the other way up. Now, what I want to do with this is have it... Um, I don't, can, I, can I preview this? Uh, I think I can preview this. There we go, I can preview it. We're looking for something like that. And uh, if you were quick, you'll notice there were two changes there, not just a calendar appearing as if by magic, but that handle moved as well. Let me show you that again. Right, it's an image that I wanted to use as a desktop image. And I wanted to put use an area of the image that, in my opinion, should be plain to um, display a calendar. So the first thing I had to do was some um, image manipulation to move this handle back to the left. And that's what I did there. I duplicated it. I put a mask on it and moved the handle back. So first of all, I got the handle out of the way. But that's nothing to do with blend modes. The next bit is to do with blend modes. And what I did was I found um, a calendar which um, there is a link for. I should put that in the chat. And uh, what I needed to do with it was just place it in here. So it's this one. And uh, I'm just dragging and dropping it. It is a vector graphic. It is an EPS. And as you can see, it's a bit on the large side. But I can move it across and uh, get it almost in the right place and then start scaling it. It has placed that image at the moment. So at the moment, I'm in an editing mode where I can resize this without losing any quality. So I'm just going to resize it so it fits neatly into the area that I've got for it. When I then press enter, that will accept that size. So I'm pressing enter and it's now a smart object, as you can see over here, which is this. Now, at the moment it's set to normal. What I'm going to do is zoom in so we can actually see that a little bit clearer. So there we go, let's move that. Maybe back a fraction. There we go. Now, it doesn't look too bad because it does have a transparent background. Luckily, it was a vector with a transparent background, but you're not always that lucky. But you can have lots of fun now with these blend modes. If I change it to overlay, it makes it very subtle. Some would say it's too subtle. Can't really see it too much, but it's definitely subtle. One of the ones that works really nicely with this, though, is um, one of the burns, which is color burn. I go up there, it looks brownish. So, um, and you've got it a nice gradient on it. So it's interacting with the background and where the background gradient is shifting, so is the color in the blend layer. And this is the blend layer. So that one I actually quite like, really like that one. But you might not like the fact that the weekends are in red and you can actually do something about that, believe it or not, with one of these more esoteric options, which is luminosity. And if you choose luminosity, they do stay a different colour. So Sundays are a different colour, but it's a brownish colour and it's very subtle. And they, that really was the only difference between the two there. You can change it again slightly differently if we go for vivid light, which is it's a... Now it's another complementary colour, but it's a much lighter one. It's not brown, it's more red, more burnt red. But what if you wanted something radically different? What are my chances of changing those Sundays to, oh, let's say green? Who wants to hazard a guess what blend mode I'd have to use to change the red to green on this image? 
There's two options. Both of them work very, very similarly. So uh, you've got you've got two options to get that right. And while you're thinking about it, I'll go do it. I will go do it. And I will choose subtract. And when I do that, I get very pale. And they're sort of, yeah, they are green. They're, they're quite bold and green. So uh, that was the one I chose, one of the subtracts. And uh, another one that worked in that kind of way was a difference, which was there. And again, very, very similar. So we've also got pin light being suggested. So let's choose pin light too. There we go. Pin light doesn't give you green, but it does give you a greyish colour. So it takes the edge off the original, which was black and quite harsh. So if you want it to be quite contrasty, but not quite black, then pin light's a good one for that. But I did say, what happens if you're not so lucky and your background isn't transparent? And I've got one of those where my background isn't transparent. This one is exactly the same calendar, but it is a PDF and it won't let me drag and drop either. So I'm going to have to do a place embedded and I'm going to have to go choose it. And it's in my vector calendars and it is a, a white PDF. And this is a preview of it at the bottom. And the difference is that this has a white background on it and it's huge, as you can see. So the first thing I need to do is to scale this down. So let's find a corner and start scaling. I will scale that down. What's going to happen with the white pixels? Is it going to be good news or bad news with the white pixels? Who's going to hazard a guess with that? Let's hear what you think while I get it the right size. And I may or may not have to worry about that being over the handle, depending on the blend mode I choose. But I can have that hanging over the end because I don't need that huge border on it. So that will work quite nicely. Let's leave it there. Right. So I'm, I'm getting suggested a screen blend mode. So uh, let's go have a look at screen. Screen will give you a nice effect, but it won't actually get rid of the background. It will show through. It will retain the white pixels. So you're going to have another another go now, aren't you? You're thinking if that does that, then what does the other? The, what's the alternative? Somebody thinks dark and somebody thinks multiply. I think you're both right. I think you could go through these options in the darken category and get some nice effects. So there's what darken looks like. Remember what it's doing. It's comparing two pixel values. White is always going to be lost when you use the darken blend modes because it's too light. It's always going to be lost. So you're never going to see your white pixels there. Multiply it will give it you stronger. And as you go through these, you start seeing the color options that you've got. So color burn, linear burn, or the darker colors. So all of the darker ones work quite nicely. The lighter ones, not so much so. You're always going to retain the white from it. And then you've got your options here with overlays and hard light, soft light. And again, no, they're not going to work too well. But just have a look through them because you get some really weird ones. If for whatever the reason you did want it blue, then exclusion is a good one to go for. But the darkened ones definitely work much better when you've got that kind of problem where you've got a white background. But you can get calendars and plenty of them, uh, including vectors there, where you have no background to worry about at all, which means that you can use any blend mode um, where you can still see the dates that you want to see and you're good to go. Right, so that was the that was explaining that blend modes also apply to vectors. But we've got one last demo, which I'm going to talk you through. There is a video of this on YouTube, so you can follow along on YouTube with that. But I have here a talk through which is an image that I've done, which is my wanted poster. And all of this was uh, made with blend modes, just various blend modes. I didn't go in here and edit any pixels whatsoever, uh, despite the fact of what the images look like when I started with them. I did not edit any of the pixels. It was all done with blend modes and masks. So I'm going to take you through what I did. And I'm going to use a feature here called layer comps. And what this is going to do is allow me to wind back to what it looked like when I started and then literally walk through each individual piece. So we'll get it to the full size and we'll go back, back in time to the starting point. And that was the starting point. Um, I started with a background. That was the first thing I had. The next image that I had was an image of the elderly gentleman. And as you can see, that is square. The other elements I had were this here. So I'll zoom in so you can see that. That is a badge that just says wanted. 
that's it that's all it says and it's transparent and the last uh, oh no I've got another element here which is uh, the text which is um, just text there and I had a piece of paper as well I do believe which is that one so let me just turn the text off and I had a piece of paper and that's it those were the elements I had how come it ended up looking like this when it was complete was just with masks and blend modes okay so I'm going to go right back to the beginning which was that now what I need to do with that is it's far too light so I need it to be much darker what blend mode should I use let's see if you all fall into the same trap again what blend mode should I use if I want to uh, I have another I have a copy of it and I need to apply a blend mode to it I'm going to click away there or you'll read it lighten multiply uh, not lighten not lighten why not lighten or darken remember what you're doing here what I've got is these blend modes are being it's been applied to an image that is exactly the same as the one below it Graham's got it they're the same image so lighten and darken won't work it won't work in that circumstance what it needs to be is multiply it takes the value of the two pixels and multiplies them together and it makes it darker and I thought that's looking much better but it's still not dark enough so I did it again I duplicated that layer and made it much darker it was starting to come together at this stage but then I needed the edges darkening um, I thought it needs a vignette on it so I did that too and I painted that on now I also used um, a multiply for that it's just some brown pixels on a layer of its own as you can see if you're trying to add color to something like that you don't particularly want it to be solid color like that and if I change just the opacity yes I'd see the pixels underneath it but it starts to look muddy so that's where I said blend modes were much better so I used multiply on that and got the burnt looking edges to it then all I needed to do was to put the poster on it. So all that is is a piece of paper. So a picture of a piece of paper. Uh, it's got um, some extra things on it. It's got a drop shadow on it. So it stands up off the background. That was it. And then I have an image. I had the image of the gentleman. But if you remember, that was blue. Had a blue hat on it. So I needed to do quite a bit to that. Uh, first thing I needed to do was add a mask to it so I didn't want to cut away the pixels in case I wanted to go back to it being square but what I did do was put a mask on it which you've just seen me take off there so I masked it quite gently around the edges that was it and then I changed the blend mode and if you were quick you'd have noticed what that blend mode was I could have tried all of these do I want it darker that sort of merged it in what I wanted it to look like was very merged with the paper so that one wasn't bad. Uh, that one was too dark, I thought. And in the end, I decided I didn't really like the colour. The lighten categories won't work because they're far too light. It doesn't make them merge in properly. Overlay wasn't bad, but I wanted to lose the colour completely. So what I decided to go for was down here, luminosity. And that gave me the look that I absolutely wanted to get spot on. Then all I needed uh, was the text and the stamp. Now the stamp up here, if I turn that on, you can see there's my stamp and I'm going to zoom into it so we can see that. And I thought the problem with that stamp was the fact that it's a little bit too perfect here. Over on the left hand side it was a bit too perfect. And this was another one of those blend modes that I thought I'm never going to use that one. But I found a use for it and that is the dissolve blend mode which um, randomizes the pixels so when I turn that on it kind of distresses it it gives it a distressed look that's really one of the only occasions I found a use for that and uh, I like the effect with that so I did that and uh, that sorted out the badge that I needed so I'm going back to the full screen there the only thing I then needed to do was to put some text on it and uh, I used specific fonts for that which is uh, Nashville and um, then there was my uh, completed wanted poster and as you see it was simply a matter of just turning layers on and off and changing the blend modes I did not edit any pixels whatsoever which was fantastic because it was really quick all I needed was the original uh, wooden background 
uh, the picture of the gentleman, the stamp and the text that I typed. The only pixels that I actually added to that were the vignette and I changed the blend mode to multiply and that was it. Now I would do that completely for you but it takes about 15 minutes so I'm going to leave that alone and um, come out of there now. So that's the last demo I wanted to show you. Let's go back in here and yes, that was all about blend modes and beyond Photoshop blend modes. But of course, there's plenty more to learn with Photoshop. And um, I have a few recordings available. If you uh, missed our uh, look at layers and masks, that recording is available. Also, we took a deep dive on smart objects and that is available as well. And the third one that sort of completes it was um, automating Photoshop, where we looked at speeding up work with automation. So processing multiple files and creating entire scripted workflows for watermarking and uh, much, much more. But now something that you definitely won't have seen yet because we haven't done it yet. And that is next month on the 13th of February we are looking at Adobe Cooler. If you've never heard of Cooler, you don't know what you're missing. Adobe Cooler is Adobe's online color creation, collaboration and sharing service. Uh, you can create color schemes and use them anywhere. So you can use them on websites, in Photoshop. It's a great way of creating color palettes. Uh, the stuff that you have in Cooler even synchronizes via a Creative Cloud account. And you can, of course, get a free Creative Cloud account. So if you're, if you're still on an older version of Photoshop, doesn't stop you getting a free Creative Cloud account to use applications like Cooler. Because it's not only a web service, it's also got a free iOS application. So you can synchronize between your desktop and your mobile device. It's a fantastic app and I shall be looking at that. Now, I know that there is no version yet for Android. That, that's sad. It saddens me. But I do have something exciting for Android users. You won't be left out. It will ease the pain of the fact that Cooler is not yet available on Android. So I hope you'll join me for some more fun with design next month. I shall put the link in the uh, chat right now so you can join us. And just to remind you, I have been Elaine Giles. You can find me all over the internet as Elaine Giles, but specifically my blog, elainegiles.co.uk. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, and YouTube as The Elaine Giles. I put some new videos up this week, and there's another one ready to go tomorrow, and that's all design-related. So make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss it. And I shall say thank you all for attending, and I'm going to head off into Q&A. And I hope that everybody has got lots of questions or comments or queries. Quite happy no matter what. And uh, I shall see you next time. Right, so what I'm going to do now is say... Uh, Good evening and goodbye to all the people who have been with us on YouTube. I hope you have found that useful and uh, I hope you will join us next month when we look at Adobe Cooler. But until then, goodbye to all the people on YouTube. <laughs>